Welcome everyone to our first ever Commonwealth Club Equality Series brought to you by Salesforce. For those of you who don't know, the Commonwealth Club is the nation's largest and oldest public affairs forum, open to all for the nonpartisan discussion of every important issue. Now tonight we are thrilled to kick off an amazing conversation with an incredible leader, but before we do, I want to thank Salesforce for making tonight possible. And Alaska Airlines, our preferred travel partner for supporting this event. Thank you. Just a couple quick housekeeping notes. If you got a cell phone, please silence it. And second, please feel free to share this event with your friends, family, and colleagues. Use the hashtag equality for all. Now I'm very excited to welcome our sponsor to the stage, State Salesforce's President and Chief Product Officer, Brett Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, John, and uh, I want to thank the Commonwealth Club. It's such an amazing institution with an incredible purpose that we're extremely excited to support. Um, Salesforce is a company that's founded on our values, uh, and we value not only the trust and success of our customers and obviously innovation, being in the technology industry, we also value equality. And fundamentally, we think business is the greatest platform for change in the world. And we take pride in using that platform to advance the cause of equality. Um, and we try to put that into practice by advocating for equal pay, equal access to education, equal rights, and equal opportunity. And every single employee of Salesforce, thank you. I and every single employee of Salesforce is an ally to the LGBTQ community, and it's such a privilege to be here in Pride Month. This month, over 5,000 Salesforce employees will participate in Pride Parades. And on Sunday, 1,000 of us will be on the streets of San Francisco. So thank you again for letting us be a part of this incredible evening. And we hope you enjoy tonight's program. Thank you very much. And now welcome to our stage, our host, Michelle Miao, and our special guest, Lauren Morelli. Here we are in our normal lives. Here we are, normal lives. Lauren, welcome. Welcome back to San Francisco. Thanks for having me. It's so nice to be here. And happy Pride. Happy Pride. Yeah. Yeah. Happy That's right. Pride. That's right. So let's start with your personal journey. I think that's that's a fun question. That's let's fun. do it. Yeah, tell me all your secrets. What was life like as <laughs> Minnie Lauren? Where did wow. you grow up? I'm gonna go so deep. Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh originally. We get some Pittsburghers one in the of, house. One of my one of my cousins from Pittsburgh is here this evening. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is true. Actually, we come from a very small. Italian family, and nobody ever leaves Pittsburgh uh, except the two of us. And we are, re this is how few people li leave. We are referred to as the California kids. He, li <laughs> he lives in Marin, and I live in LA. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so, you know, Hollywood, breaking into Hollywood, uh, Hollywood is such a coveted industry. Mm. And everyone's always going to ask, like, you know, how did you get in? But really, my question is, how did you get into the writing room of one of the most groundbreaking series of our time, which is Orange is the New Black? You know, the trick of that is that no one knows anything is groundbreaking until people decide after the fact <laughs> that it's groundbreaking, right? So what's amazing now looking back on it is, yes, I was very lucky um, to get hired on Orange. It was my first writing job. So I was, you know, even if it had been... I don't know, like Oscar the cat goes to wherever, goes to Pittsburgh. Like I would have been thrilled to write on that show. Um, but it was on Netflix and Netflix at the time was a DVD company. So when I told people, like I finally got my first writing job. And so I would tell people that I'd finally gotten staffed and they'd be like, oh my God, that's amazing. Where's the show gonna be? And I'd be like, it's gonna be on Netflix. And they'd be like, that's a DVD company. <laughs> like people would be like, it's, so it's going to be a web series. That's so cute. <laughs> That's, congratulations on your writing gig. Whoa. You know, it was like, <laughs> truly. I, um, I was a personal assistant at the time, and my parents were like, 
will they hold your job for you? Like, this is really... Um, so <laughs> I think if I had come to it later after it was groundbreaking, I might not have been so lucky. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny. We kind of have parallel stories. I mean, when I got my start in radio, it was AM radio. And so people were like, you realize no one can hear you after 8 o'clock, right? <laughs> right, 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 yeah. right, right. And, the, and you're and like, but I'm doing it. Yeah. And they're like, don't leave your job. And my job at the time was uh, working at Sephora. It was? <laughs> I could be selling you lipstick today. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, I'm going to ask you potentially an embarrassing question. Because all night long, I've been thinking that your makeup looks great. Oh. But, but you did it. No. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My lovely wife did. Oh, your wife did it, a great job. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, she was in the audience. I was super fussy. I was like, no more. Don't add any more. No, no. Like, it looks you great. don't get to demand anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Happy pride. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So going back to, you know, working on uh, Tales, and, or, I'm sorry, we're going to get to Tales because I'm excited I believe, about I Tales. You. Yeah. But Orange is the New Black, I mean, opened the doors for so many different characters and even, you know, the storyline was just something super different. You don't really think about telling the story of the lives of folks in incarcerated, period, right? Yeah. And being around in such a diverse atmosphere that's got to impact your personal life like you uh, sure as a writer as a creator as a producer but how did the show impact um your personal life and i know that that's wow, such really a set me that's up such that a lo <laughs> loaded question yeah, I know. <laughs> um well the <laughs> it's so funny to have to say this like you don't know the answer already i know <laughs> The, the show changed my personal life, Michelle, because I, well, when I got hired on Orange, I was married to my husband. I had got mar gotten married. Actually, uh, it was one of those times in life, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, where I was 30. I was engaged to a man that I loved very much, and then I got hired on Orange, and I truly felt like, I have it all figured out. <laughs> like, look at these boxes that I checked. <laughs> Everything is going to be great. And then, um, and so when I got hired on Orange, I had to actually take a week off from the writer's room to go and get married uh, to my husband at the time. And, and then when I was in the writer's room, um, you know, because we were talking about women a lot and because we were talking about incarcerated women, we were talking about a lot of different sexualities and gender identities and, and having writer's rooms are infamously really um, tender and vulnerable. So much of it is uh, um, trafficking on your own personal stories and what you bring to the literal table in the room. And so I had started sort of wondering about my sexuality, which was a very funny thing to be doing at the age of 30. And I remember going to therapy and being like, maybe I'm just bi and I didn't know it. Um, but in that case, like I, I would meet someone of any gender and fall in love with them and get married and I'm doing that. It just happens to be with a man and I just never knew. Um, and so we got married <laughs> and, um, and then about five months later I went to set, um, for my first ever episode of television and I met a tiny baby actress on the show named Samira Wiley and <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. I couldn't, I really couldn't understand what was happening, but I was like following her around set like a puppy dog. <laughs> like wherever she went, I would go. And I was like, well, this is weird. <laughs> um, and that began a year of hell, truly, uh, of figuring out that I was gay and doing a lot of personal work on myself and having a lot of difficult conversations with not only my husband, but everyone in my life. Um, and eventually gathering the courage and strength to, at the time it felt like blowing up my life, you know, which is really interesting because now six years later it feels like everything. Yeah. It feels like all of my joy was derived from that journey, but at the time it was really difficult. So that's how it impacted my <laughs> personal life. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a chance to send you a toaster, but I did. <laughs> we'll still accept it. Now. <laughs> I did read somewhere, though, that the community was absolutely welcoming um, when you did come out. And yeah. that felt really good. Yeah, it felt amazing. I felt, you know, this thing we do in our lives where we always feel like imposters and we always feel like we're not good enough and that we're the only one who feels that way. Um, I feel like that so many, in so many ways in my life, but I translated that to the queer community when I was coming out and I just felt like a fraud in many ways and that I wouldn't be accepted because I think the narrative that we get told a lot 
especially publicly and in the media, is that you know when you're very young, and um, and if you don't come out, then you've been lying about it or hiding it. There's, um, I think, a lot of really damaging stories that we get told, and but it was the exact opposite. My experience was the opposite. It was just like, you know, queer people are so good at holding space for nuance and diverse stories and so good, I think, in many ways of accepting that. And so it was just like, oh, you're gay? Cool, come on in. Like, it was so <laughs> lovely. Um, it's such an amazing community to be a part of. I agree. I it's so fun, agree. right? Right, yeah. It's it's incredibly special. Yeah. Which is why I love Tales of the City so much. Good transition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing about Tales is I, I could really feel uh, your growth, like, personally, and, and evolution if you just... Oh, if, that's so nice. Well, yeah. It, you know, you were one of the writers um, of Orange is the New Black and a showrunner. But uh, looking at Tales and knowing that you're the executive producer... Um, co-executive ex executive producer, I saw myself in Tales. Hmm. Now, I'll be honest, skeptical and one of the, uh, you know, San Franciscans who are like, okay, if there's a new Tales, it's got to be like what it was, the original series that yeah. was created by Armistead Maupin. And I was looking for that, but once I saw myself and I saw that I was represented, not just like a lesbian woman that they had created in Hollywood or uh, traditionally speaking mm -hmm. uh, but I saw a non-conforming person a queer person a trans person a person of color biracial couples people picking up and talking about HIV AIDS I mean I really saw myself why does representation matter oh my gosh I think about how transformative it is and how you don't, you know, if you're a person who's accustomed to seeing themselves represented in the media, um, it took me, a, because, because I was one of those people for 30 years of my life, right? I was used to seeing straight, white, cis women on television all the time. Now, maybe I didn't look like them, or maybe I wasn't as perfect as them, and that's its own damaging thing. But um, I think about what it might have done for me if I had grown up seeing someone that on television that I had been able to be like, oh, that's me, and how transformative that would have been for myself. Um, it's just this immediate message of like, you're okay. You're okay because you exist, and you exist because we're mirroring yourself mm -hmm. to you. And, and, and if you can exist on this television, you can exist in your everyday life, and especially a thing with tales, and, and this is Armistead's gift to all of us and to me, is he's portraying queer people and people of color receiving love and joy and acceptance because of their identities rather than suffering. Because that's the other thing is, even when we do see ourselves, we see ourselves. And um, so often it, they are stories of suffering and they are stories of pain and they are stories of literal death Mm -hmm. um, and so if that's your only version that you see of your life, uh, it's really hard to imagine something different. Yeah, yeah. Now, you went in to this project first as a, a writer, and you were writing for Ellen Page's character, Shauna. Yeah. But you ended up, you know, writing the whole thing. Like, I mean, how did, how did Tales fall into your lap and, and then have it evolved into something much bigger than you had initially planned. Yeah. Um, you know, Laura Linney said this recently, and guys, I hang out with Laura Linney. It's no big deal. You're so cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are those moments, right, where things come out of my mouth. And I'm like, what just, what just happened? Um, uh, she was saying in an interview about Tales that, because she, cause Tales has been in her life for 25 years, and um, she was saying that Tales has a way of making your life better. And that has certainly been my um, experience with it. So yeah, so I came in to write for Shauna. Um, this current iteration of the show had been in development for two years at Netflix with a different writer. And the call I got was like, we're having a hard time nailing down 
Shauna's voice. We're having a hard time making sure she feels authentic, uh, which on some level, great, right? I'm so glad that there are groups of people sitting around worrying that the queer voice sounds authentic. Wonderful. On another level, it's like, oh, of course, there's like a group of, you know, <laughs> older straight people sitting around being like, what do young gay people do these days? <laughs> 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 if only you knew. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know. Oh, God, I know. Um, so <laughs> I'm censoring so many things right now. Um, so <laughs> so I, I came in and um, I, I did some work on Shauna's character and um, sort of worked on what her storyline throughout the series might be. And then I got this call from Netflix one day and they were like, we want you just to write a version of the pilot. And I was like, uh, well, I mean, okay, uh, sure. But like it's Armistead Heads and there's this other writer and it's, it was just all so terrifying. Um, but they were really wonderful about being like, just make it yours, just like fly free and go. And so I did that. Mm -hmm. And that was the script that they ended up green lighting us off of. So, um, when they greenlit us, I they asked me to show run, and here we are, two years later. Dang! Congratulations! Thank yeah, you. that's worthy. Thanks. Worthy. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> um, the other thing I loved about Tales that I saw that it just completely ignored, you know, that it was Armistead's original project, and I was looking at it as Lauren's, mm. um, was that the storylines, the character development, they were telling real, authentic stories. Like, and I mentioned this to you in a previous interview, but the characters of Jake and Margot, who are a couple, that was very striking for me. You know, uh, Jake is, he's transitioned, he tr identifies as a trans man now, but they got together because of the, the script. And so we know that they were together before Jake had transitioned, yes. and they struggle through the relationship um, like, that was very real to the point where I was like, there's no way that she could have just written all of this stuff on her own. Mm. And, you know, it was evident that there were other queer people in the writing room. So talk about, like, how important it, how important it is when you're bringing a group of people together and you're talking about, you know, LGBTQ people's lives. Mm. Even for a project like this, you have to have diversity. Yes. And, well, it's important to say we had an entirely queer writer's room. Um, and because I think it's time to start expanding our idea of diversity. Mm. <laughs> 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 um, guys, I'm going to leave here feeling great tonight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, because for so long, right, like you hire, let's say, a lesbian woman to run a show, and that's really exciting and revolutionary, and there's someone sitting in an office somewhere who can be like, did it, did my job. But what gets tricky about that, especially on a show like Tales, is there's, as you just said, there's such a wide range of character on the show. And and I, I don't love the idea that we can only write people who are like ourselves. I think that's dangerous. I think that's called memoir. Fiction exists for a reason. But there is something, to your point, really undeniable about lived experience. So I have the lived experience of my own identity. You have your lived experience. Someone else who has a different gender identity than me has a very different lived experience, and they can bring a really subtle specificity that I probably couldn't. I could approximate it, but I wouldn't be able to say, actually, when I went through this with my girlfriend after transitioning, we had X, Y, Z conversation. And those were the things that we were talking about in the writer's room. And, and when I talk about like expanding diversity, right? it's like there were six other queer people in the writer's room, and one of them was in her 60s, and she is white and a lesbian, but she's in her 60s. Her identity, and what that looks like and what being a gay woman and what that means to her is so different from what my identity means to me. And in many ways, like I sit here because of work that she did. And so having some of those intergenerational conversations, I think really informed a lot of what you're feeling and having um, really tough conversations about 
we present as the queer community, we present as a monolith, and we are anything but. Mm-hmm. Anything but. Thank you. Thank you for that. My yeah. pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Casting. Yes. That was also really amazing. And I know, you know, of course, we have to keep Laura Linney, uh, Olympia Dukakis, mm-hmm. but um, in the series, uh, Jen Richards, tra- a trans woman, mm-hmm. trans actress, plays a young Olympia Dukakis or Anna Magical. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, uh, there was something intentional about it all, and some of the characters that I even talked about, like for example, Jake's character is played by Garcia, who's also trans. Like you're very intentional about ensuring that also the authenticity was in the actors and actresses who played these roles. That hasn't really happened in Hollywood, at least not very much. I mean, yeah. we don't have to go far back. Uh, Eddie Redmayne played a trans woman. He's a cisgender, you know, white actor. Played. Um, a trans woman in Danish Girl, uh, Jared Leto in Dallas Buyers Club. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, touch on, <laughs> on authenticity and casting and, and kind of, you know, some of the strategies that you might have employed um, while you were casting and reaching the community and making sure that you were really t- telling stories from the community. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, I have so much to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know... Uh, well, on on the face of it, I think it's pretty obvious, but I'll say it just in case it's not obvious, right? When you have authentic casting, it means that the conversation doesn't stop at the script. The conversation continues when you get on set. So when you have a young non-binary trans person like Garcia playing Jake, when you get to set and that person's about to film a scene, you can say, how does this feel to you? Does this feel... Like, it sits right to your lived experience. Do you have thoughts about it when the director is also trans? Suddenly there's a lot of people who get to contribute to the creative process instead of just having to show up and say words and go home. And that makes it much richer. Um, But doing stuff like that, all it takes is extra work. That's all it takes. Mm. So when we were casting Jake, finding a young Latinx trans person was going to be hard. When you ask your casting director for that type, they don't have a list of 100 people the way they do when you need a white straight person. And so that means doing community outreach. That means posting on social media. That means it was one of the most beautiful experiences of my life because we had, we asked, we said no experience necessary. We had all of these young trans men across the country submitting tapes. And some of that was reading the scene, and some of it was them talking to camera about their experience Mm. and about who they were. And it was just, it was really remarkable to have that experience. And, And so on some level, it's like, it's more work, but I benefit from that, the show benefits from that. We discovered this remarkable young person named Garcia, who's now one of my dearest friends and like lights up the screen every time, they're non-binary every time they're on screen. Um, so I don't know about this narrative of like, oh, I just, I, I don't know, I have to teach people how to do stuff and I had, this is now my old person <laughs> impression, I guess, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I just, it just, it's so rewarding to me. It's so yeah. rewarding to go outside of the parameters of the people that you normally see yeah. on screen. Do you think that it's time in Hollywood with all of these, you know, campaigns going on um, and issues, right? And these movements that's happening, like racial equality, gender equality, LGBTQ equality, like some of these movements that are happening. And now um, shows like Tales of the City, 10 episodes streaming on Netflix with real authentic characters telling real lived experiences. Do you think that it's time? that Hollywood would start employing these same strategies that you're using and also think about, you know, the way that they've been doing things of just really, yeah, we're, it's yeah. Beyond, we're beyond that. I think we are. I think the challenge of it and what takes time, and I think about this a lot because, as you mentioned earlier, like this was my first time show running and executive producing, so I have suddenly handed a lot of power. And I think it's very important for me, at least, to handle that power responsibly and to make sure that, like, with my writers, 
that 50% of my room had never been in a writer's room before. And what that means now is that there are th at least three more people who are in the pipeline who weren't in the pipeline before. So the next time someone wants to hire a queer showrunner or any showrunner, <laughs> God forbid we wouldn't be identified as our, you know, as our sexualities, um, that they'll be there and that I will hopefully have taught them what Genji Kohan taught me before. It just is about m switching the power paradigm, I think. And because to your point, we're getting there, we're really getting there, but the same people are still in power. And I do have a lot of faith that we're, you know, I have some power that I didn't have two years ago. So we just have to keep pushing in that direction and pulling the people up behind us so that it doesn't end at me, so that I'm doing this for other people, not for myself. Yeah, and it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna go home now, I did it. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's been so great. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Uh, but you know, Netflix. It, it, there's there are a lot of opportunities for this type of change and the things that you're doing, in which we're not really focused on. Uh, say, for example, the product having to be the return on investment conversation, right? Mm. Like if we we were to cast a big star, like that's going to get us so many eyeballs. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but the big stars we don't have a whole lot of them um, who are LGBTQ, non-binary, sure. non-conforming, just like you said. So. How is, you know, working with Netflix or producing two very successful, you know, shows now? Um, yeah. Like, I mean, do you feel like th that is a brand new home, brand new way where that will open more doors for LGBTQ actors, actresses, and even people in the writing room? Yeah. You know, there are so many parts of this conversation. The first thing is Netflix is amazing. Um, it's the DVD company <laughs> is is the only place I've ever worked as a writer, which is insane. Mm. Um, so I've now spent the last seven years of my career there. And I really can say, honestly, this isn't even me d giving you a bunch of BS because we're sitting on a stage. Um, they're just so supportive. And what was amazing in making, about making Tales there was, from the creative perspective, like the Jake and Margot storyline is perfect. It's really nuanced, it's pretty niche. That would be a story that would be really easy to get a lot of notes on, right? Like our audience is gonna understand this. Like, you know, Jake has transitioned. He now identifies as male. Over the course of the season, he's realizing that he's gay. There's a lot of stuff of like parsing out sexuality and gender and um, stuff that I think for people who are mired in the queer community, we're witnessing that happening in our social circles every day, all day. And never once did I get a note on any of it. Mm. And in fact, I have felt from, and this is true, from the creative executive level to the PR level to the marketing, it's like, can we make it gayer? <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, wow. they did this incredible campaign and none of this came from me where they went out across the country and found queer leaders in cities and activists and influencers and put them on billboards because they just understood. I, I, I feel so often like they show me what the show is, you know, instead of me telling them like, no, 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 you have to make a gay or like, no, 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 you have to whatever. Um, and part of that is because there's just so much space now that you know, we gripe about how many TV shows are being made, but it does allow space for shows that maybe speak to a smaller audience. So we no longer have to be Big Bang Theory. We can be Tales of the City and it's a global audience. So. I firmly believe that we need tales in America right now. We need to remember that we are safe and we have safe spaces and that we have loving communities. I think that's very important. But if we need it, imagine how much the rest of the world needs it, mm. right? Yeah. And, and that is a thing that is accessible because of Netflix that would not be accessible to me as a storyteller otherwise. Wow. It's pretty remarkable. It is. Yeah. It is. Thank you. Global audience. Yes. I kind of felt like that also played a role in terms of the production of Tales. Mm. I, I know that um, many of my friends, especially those who are huge fans of the novels and of course the San, the San Francisco Chronicles, um, uh, the, the editorial or the, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the PBS you know, version, the three episodes or so, lots of them were saying like, I wanted to see more San Francisco. Mm. Yes. I figured. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get the Salesforce tower in the shot, so. 
<laughs> what if I just got like run off the stage right now? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, tell me more about that. Yeah. Um, well, meaning like you know, the location shooting, the aesthetics. Um, mm -hmm. But then in my mind, I'm like, if it, it's a global audience and the movement has changed and we're now looking, you know, 30 years after the fact um, where, the, you know, the show picks up, where yeah. the tales picks up, I kind of see San Francisco queers, the idea is that we can be everywhere. Right. Right. But that was from my perspective, I'd love to hear from you. If you do you feel that it is it's San Francisco? On many levels I do. Yeah. It's very interesting to be telling a story about a city ooh about a city that's sort of in crisis with itself. <laughs> um there's a lot <laughs> <laughs> You said it very well. Thank you. I think there's a lot, I hear it, I don't live here, right? I love the city, I'm here all the time. I live in LA and it was, it's been really interesting to me because what I hear constantly from people who do live here is, but San Francisco's gone. San Francisco's gone. And, and there's so much nostalgia to tales and so I think I'm very aware that we are telling stories in some ways about a San Francisco that, according to all of you, might not exist anymore. Right? And so there's some anger about that. There's an uh, understandable anger about what has been taken um, from marginalized people, from the queer community. Um, but I, th I feel like, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, there's a magic that exists here and there's a sensibility. And th the sensibility is articulated to me even in the anger, right? That people are still mad that the city has changed and grieving because of the city that the city has changed. To me, it feels like there's still that like, but we're different, but, but we're accepting, but we're, and if San Francisco is magical, Tales is magical, and maybe we all live in the same place. Mm. Does that make sense? It does, it does. And also, I do want to add, I mean, what's so beautiful about San Francisco and also about the queer community, LGBTQ community, is that there's never a day that we aren't fighting. And Boy, do and we hate things. <laughs> No, and what I mean by that is, is uh, our movement started, you know, through resistance. Yeah. Right. So yeah. we're celebrating 50 years of Stonewall, and so even if there are changes, our voices don't go away, and we're mad as hell, but we keep on fighting. And there are people here in this city who continue to fight, and that we, you know, celebrate. So I'm very proud of that, at least that these things yeah. are happening but we're still continuing to survive. Um, we're helping each other, we're working with each other. So- um, Giving voice to what you want, giving voice to the yeah. ideal, right? Yeah. yeah. I always think about that Hannah Gatsby quote, um, uh, like, are people love to have opinions about things? <laughs> you know, like, even with tales coming out, I was like, oh yeah, people are gonna have opinions. People yeah. love to have opinions. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's true of all human beings. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so, LGBTQ stories are very important to tell. Um, future projects. <sighs> Does that mean that, you know, we'll have a ton more LGBTQ uh, stories from, from Lauren, kind of in the same vein? If I should be so lucky. I hope so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel really passionate about it. I feel, you know, while we're still in a world where there aren't a lot of the stories being told and there also aren't a lot of people from the community being empowered to tell those stories. Um, I feel a great deal of privilege to be able to do that. So I'm gonna run with the ball for as long as they'll let me, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of you know, the, the privilege, as you said, I had imagined this thing that you would continue, you and many Laurens out there, mm. um, because if you're opening the door for so many of us, imagine that, that breakthrough moment, right? And there are lots of LGBTQ people who are writers, who are producers, who are bosses, uh, who are big actors and actresses. And um, I wonder, you know, if you were to do that and they could be out and they could be themselves and they could be authentic and they could be proud and they can tell their own stories. Like, what would that do to the industry in itself? Like, do you think that it would just be super 
progressive, super different. I mean, I have no idea how Hollywood works hmm. um, in, in a way, you know, and I, and, I, and I think a lot of us, if you're reading the media, we think people go into very dark rooms or it seems like, it, you know, it's incredibly unsafe by some of the stories that we've heard. How could, you know, more LGBTQ people, if we were to imagine them as big bosses, decision makers and being themselves, like how would that like revolutionize the entire industry? Mm and the products that come out of it? Such an interesting question. You know, and, and on some level, I almost, when I think about the industry, I mean, I would be thrilled, and I know it's coming for more and more people from the community to be empowered. I kn I'm watching it happen in front of us right now. But I also know that if those people aren't also kind <laughs> and generous, and open-minded, right? Because like having that moniker in front of your name, like being a part of the LGBTQ community doesn't necessarily mean that you're creating a safe space. And I really think that that's what we need more than anything in the industry right now. Um, I'm sure you know enough about the industry to know that like there's a lot of ego. We have a very specific, in general as people, right? We have a very specific idea of what it means to hold power. And for so long that has looked like a certain kind of toxicity and a certain kind of um, ego and making other people feel unsafe. And that is the thing that I feel very invested in overturning um, because no matter what we do, we're still probably only gonna be 10% of the population, right? God, I hope that expands. Let's be 50% of the population. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe we already are. Yeah. Um, but it's well and good to hold the power. It's an entirely other thing, I think, to relate to it in a way where it doesn't require us to like grip it with an iron fist, right? Like I can hold my power and nothing you do. Um, violates it or threatens it. In fact, like you being a part of the conversation, in fact, enhances it and allows me to do my job better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. One question, you know, just to, to follow up on that, um, bosses out there in the world. Obviously, not all, not all bosses out there in the world are LGBTQ. Yeah. But there certainly are a lot of bosses out there. And so if you were, you know, a, a leader mm. in, a, in an executive, um, and employing LGBTQ people, hmm. you know, what are some of the things as a boss, you yourself, right? Showrunner, producer, someone who hires folks, like what, what are some um, recommendations or some advice hmm. like you would give to a lot of the leaders and bosses out there who could be making change in their cult, in the culture, their environment, their workplace? Hmm. What a good question. I think it's really important to ask questions and I think it's really important to facilitate dialogue. I don't know, for me at least, that w I see enough listening right now. Um, and again, I think people sometimes hold their power in a way that's like, I know what's best, this is how we're gonna do things, this is how I'm gonna run it, instead of like, Michelle, what do you think we could be doing better? Or like, are there ways that I'm missing you? Or are there ways in which my language might make you feel unsafe in the writer's room or it just really requires checking your ego at the door every single day and being able to have forgiveness about the mistakes you make, right? I mean, we had a lot of really hard conversations in our writer's room and everybody was queer, but there were still plenty of times where we were offending each other, where someone of one generation was saying something and someone else was saying like, oh, that's not okay. There were plenty of times where I was facilitating difficult conversations between said parties. Um, it's really easy to miss the marginalized folks amongst us. It's really easy to forget that not everybody has your own life experience. Mm -hmm. And, and that happens all the day, all the time for gay people, right? Like how often do we live in spaces where, I don't know, you're reading an article about how to be a good wife. That's not a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, I'm trying to get at like, the pronouns are always the same, right? Like you'll, you'll read an article about a wedding gift and it'll be like, well, like for the bride, you could get in for the groom. And when you read that, you feel missed. Mm -hmm. You feel like, wow, I'm not even represented in this thing anymore. And so in a workplace environment, to get missed really, it, I think can be very difficult and, and damaging and um, encourages people to be quiet mm -hmm. instead of feeling valued. 
were there things that you did on the set, you and uh, you know other bosses, um, that you did on the set that made it more safe for LGBTQ mm. people to show up to work and you know be themselves? Um, there's, I mean, through Orange is the New Black and Tales, there's so many of uh, LGBTQ actors, especially you know trans, and we yeah. hear this in the news and the media right now. Yeah, it's not every day that a trans person of color, you know, goes to work on on a set. And yeah. let alone is hired for a job. We, we talk about these issues a lot in the LGBTQ community. Yeah. What are some things, whether subtle or big, that you did, you know, on set that made people feel that they were welcomed, celebrated, mm. that they, they felt safe to come to work? We tried very hard to make sure that queer people were represented on every level of the production so that, you know, let's say you're a trans woman who's been hired on tails and you show up and the entire crew is maybe straight and white and male. That doesn't feel very safe. That feels like you're the, still the only one. That still feels like you're tokenized. That still feels like you might have to explain your identity to someone. Um, so hiring on every level felt important. For me personally, I try very hard. I don't know how successful I am, but I, I try very hard to let everybody know that their voice matters and that everybody's opinion counts. So if you're a, a PA who like on a set, a PA is a person who shows up and like schleps cases of water around and you know, you're like at the, the low end of the totem pole. Um, we had a bunch of queer PAs and I really tried to make their voices heard and so that it feels a little more based in equality and a little less like show up, shut up and mm. do your yeah. job. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It's pride and, you know. Is it? We, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, it's like when we look for these symbols, I feel like we do that as LGBTQ people. And then so like, you know, you walking in rocking um, uh, earrings with the uh, rainbow, fl you know, colors. Guys, that I had really matters. great earrings on yeah. earlier. And <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And I had to take them off because they were going to mess up our sound, but I just want everyone to acknowledge that I was wearing really great rainbow earrings. Oh, you did take them off. Oh, sorry. You did take them off. It's okay. We can still yeah. talk about my earrings. No, no, no. But I mean, we look for, we look for these symbols and, um, <laughs> that make, that makes people feel safe. Yeah. And I wanted to know your thoughts about that. Like if, if we did those very subtle things, you know, just like raising the flag. Yes. You know, uh, someone posted that. Oh, I know. One of our directors from Tales, um, an amazing director named Sydney Freeland, who's trans, posted this the other day on her Instagram. And I had no idea. She posted a picture of a little cutout trans flag that I guess was on the doorway to our production office. And she posted the picture and she said, this was the first thing I saw when I walked into the Tales production office. I didn't put that flag there. I didn't tell anyone to put that flag there. I have no idea. I probably never even clocked it. But these small things, right? It's amazing to me at the, the hotel where I am here in San Francisco, like, and San Francisco is not a place where you really have to look hard for symbols, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I was so struck today, like looking out in my hotel room and seeing a pride flag being flown. That is sort of the same thing that we're talking about with seeing ourselves on television, right? Like I see that flag and I know I'm okay. In this moment, I'm okay. Right. In this moment, I don't have to come out to anyone. In this moment, I'm seen. In this moment, I'm valued. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it totally is. As we look into, you know, the your future um, <laughs> in, in a lot of ways, like Talk I'm, I'm, I'm already talking about, you know, your new project, uh, but I wonder... Who are some people that you would love to work with? Oh my God, that's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> this is good, we're getting heckled now. Um, who are some people that I would love to work with? This is going to sound fake, but I really mean it. Um, I hired these six queer writers for my writer's room. I worked very hard to find them. Three of them had never been in writer's rooms but they were accomplished writers of their own right. They were playwrights, they were memoirists. Um, I sort of found people everywhere. And that meant that they came into the room, some of them with a beginner's mind, which I think is why you see some of what you see on screen. Um, and they're brilliant. They're brilliant, brilliant people. And I consider them my chosen family now. Mm. And they are people with whom I hope to work for them <laughs> one day, truly. And they, they feel like, they're the 
I don't necessarily look ahead of me anymore because those people are fine. Like, do I want to work with Ryan Murphy? No. <laughs> like, um, um, uh, he's fine. Ryan Murphy's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan Murphy doesn't yeah. need me, you know? Yeah. But I look behind me and I see those people and their brilliant ideas. And I'm like, oh, you guys, like, what, ooh, what can I do? Can I be your PA? Like, let's, let's figure stuff out. What's, yeah, that's so great. Thank you. Um, what other stories would you like to tell? that are not being told? You know, I, I think a lot about, with Tales, I started thinking about this and I continue to think about it now. We just don't, Armistead wrote about queer people who were just living their lives. And with Tales, it's not exactly this, but I think a lot about a show like This Is Us. And I'm like, oh right, we don't get those shows yet. We still, when we get queer shows, they have to be defined as that. They have to be very specific. You get like the lesbian show or the trans show or the gay show. And I, maybe the Fosters is a good example of this. Like shows that are just about life with people that happen to be queer. I'm very excited about that. That feels like the next step for us. Um, that like you could just tune in and watch your fun ABC you know, network family drama and it happens to be two men with a bunch of kids or uh, um, it's almost like, and I, I don't really like to use this word. I don't think it's important to normalize gay people. I think that's weird. But I do think like writing normal shows that with gay people is something I'm excited about. I love this. I love this. I can't wait for your next, you know, project. <laughs> and, uh, Parenthood and with all the, all the gays. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, for an LGBTQ person out there, I mean, whatever uh, their career, but many of us, you know, are artists and many of us want to tell our stories mm -hmm. and we want to get into the writing room. We want to get in front of the camera or in back. Uh, what advice would you have? I have so much advice. Yay! <laughs> Give them to us. Um, I wrote a very weird script that was one of the first scripts I ever wrote. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't go to school for writing. I wasn't trained. I just, I, I wouldn't even say that I taught myself. I just sort of started writing. And for years, nothing happened. No one read it. No one cared. Um, I eventually got a manager and an agent. Then I thought everything was going to be fine. Everything was not fine. Years went by. <laughs> and the very, and it, and I constantly would get, uh, calls from my agent being like, uh, we're sending you out for staffing on Glee, and then nothing would happen. We're sending you out for staffing on whatever it was, nothing would happen. And then one day I got this call that was like, Genji Cohen, whom I adored already, um, is staffing for a new show, and we're going to submit you. And she was the first person who actually read my script and responded to it and asked me to come in for a meeting. And at the time, I genuinely remember thinking, well... I've peaked. <laughs> this will be the thing where like, I'll have grandkids one day and I'll be like, you know, grandma <laughs> tried to be a writer. And she, <laughs> she was so good that she met Genji Cohan once. <laughs> 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 um, and then I got hired. And what became so clear to me afterwards was that if I had gotten staffed somewhere else where I didn't belong, I probably would have failed. But I, I got hired with a bunch of other weirdos and I was celebrated for being weird and Genji liked my weird script and she said later she found her notes um, years later from staffing for that first season and next to my name she had read my script and she wrote, oddly sexual, let's, let's meet. <laughs> <laughs> That's real. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> My mother's very proud. Um, <laughs> I guess the advice that comes from that is we get really wrapped up in people telling us how to succeed. There are lots of rules. There are lots of ways to do it. There are lots of books you could read. And I just think if you follow your joy and you sit down and you write your weird script that happens to be oddly sexual and you're willing to be patient and you're willing to work hard, the right people will find it, or they won't and you'll make it yourself, right? Like, I, 
the longer I do this, and it hasn't been very long yet, the more, I don't know that I even believe that like some people are talented and some people aren't. I believe that some people work really hard and they don't quit. Hmm. Truly. I think that's it. Oddly sexual. I'm going <laughs> to take that home. I'm going to channel that and I'm going to make it my own. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to see what comes out of it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of people in the audience who probably want to ask me more about that just because of a story that I told before we started. Um, and we'll get to that, you know, in the second installment of the Equality series. <laughs> what a cliffhanger. Yeah. So, Lauren, if we were to log into your Netflix account right oh boy. now, um, yeah. yeah, what would we find on your playlist? A lot of Queer Eye, a lot of Great British Bake Off. <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> Um, I have, I have a re this is, this is the only downside of what I do. I have a really hard time watching scripted television. I can't turn off my story brain. So when I watch now, I'm either like, oh, that was a mistake. This isn't, this isn't going to go well. Or I just know it's coming and then my wife gets mad at me because I'm like, oh, he's going to die. Um, <laughs> so I don't know that, oh, I did just watch special. You know that, that show special? There's an amazing show on Netflix right now called Special um, about a gay guy with CP. Um, and it's really lovely and really specific um, and great. I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of your wife. Yeah. Yes. I opened up that door. <laughs> you did. You did. But I mean, you know, do you think that we'll see a future project that you'll both work in together? Yeah, I really hope so. We really love working together. And it's been nice. Like, you know, our relationship was sort of formed at work. So I think it was important for us to spread our wings and work separately. And it's been really nice. We both love that we work in the same industry, but we do totally separate things. So there's a context and an understanding without a like any sort of competition or I don't even know what that would be. Um, but we're really hoping to work together again one day. Yeah. I wonder like, you know, in bed you're before you go to sleep, nothing oddly sexual. <laughs> <laughs> Just asking if, you know, the conversation goes like this, you're, the, you know, you're the producer and the writer. If you say, hey, you know what? I have the perfect character for you. <laughs> I do not pitch your ideas. You bed. don't. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> that might be oddly sexual, though. Oh, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this has been super fun. So fun. Yeah. I, it's been so great. And having you here and having this conversation, it really feels like um, family. It really does. Let me brag about you for a second. No! I, <laughs> truly, because I, I've been wanting to say this to you, so I'll say it in front of a bunch of people. You were one, so we had this amazing premiere of Tales in San Francisco at the San Francisco Film Festival, and that was our real first day of press, and it was months before the show came out, so I had spent two years of my life in like various dark rooms making something, which is a weirdly isolating experience, and you were one of the first people I sat down with and we didn't know each other at all, and you had seen the whole show, and you just got it, and you had so many really thoughtful things to say about it, and I was so starved for like discussion about the show, and I just loved, it, it really became a North Star for me throughout press, because it was like, well, Michelle got it, so maybe other people will get it. Um, truly, it, I really, and that's why I'm sitting here today, because I was like, I'll talk to you all day, oh, this is great. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know what it feels like? I mean, it feels like what it probably felt like with the relationships that you developed with a lot of the people that you've worked with who are mm -hmm. part of our community um, and who are supportive of the LGBTQ community. And you had your coming out, which was a little different than most people, maybe, you know, coming out, but yeah. on set and to the world, online and to another star and uh, these groundbreaking shows. Everybody knows what's going on. You're a divorce. I know a lot about you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so many people do, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I mentioned, you know, allies. Yeah. And I think allies are super important you know, to, uh, to our world and our work. So important. And there are a lot of our allies here today. 
Um, I'd love for you, as we start to wind down, you know, share your thoughts on, you know, what a perfect ally means in when we're people who are trying to succeed, we're trying to live, we're trying to mm. be ourselves. My mom has been on a pretty remarkable journey in her own allyship. And because I think, speaking honestly, when I first came out, it was difficult for her and we're very close and she's very open-minded, but it just wasn't, she had an idea of what my life was gonna be and this wasn't it. And we struggled around that for a while. And then last year, but she's really since then like put herself on a path of learning. She's really hungry to understand. She asks a lot of questions. And last year I got this text from her uh, something horrifying had come out from the ad current administration. I forget exactly what it was. Oh, it was like they were going to erase the word transgender from something. I forget exactly what that was. Do you remember? Uh, from some legislation. Like the word transgender was no longer going to exist in some official legislation. And my mom texted me because she had read about it. And she was really upset. And she said in the text, what can I do? And, and, I, and I was just so struck by that because it takes a lot of vulnerability to admit to somebody else that you don't know and you need help. So I think that's the first step is being, because it's, it's, it can be scary to say, I don't understand they, them pronouns, or I want to use your correct pronouns, but I'm really worried I'm gonna mess up. And I think it takes vulnerability on both sides. It takes vulnerability to admit that, and it takes vulnerability from, the, from us, right, to say, like, it's okay if you mess up. You don't have to be perfect. And the thing that I said to my mom that day was, like, talk to your friends. She lives in suburban Pittsburgh. I assume that most people there have never met anyone who identifies as trans. My mother has because of me. And I said, just talk to them talk to them about my trans friends, about your experience, like anything you can do to humanize these headlines so that they get rooted in people and empathy. I think that's how you make a difference. And I think those are the allies that we really need right now. Mm. Wow, thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have just a couple minutes and so I have one last question for you. Um, I'm a little nervous. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and it's to leave us, you know, with your your thoughts. I think it's such a special weekend to be having this conversation because you give us so much hope um, as we look back, you know, the 50 years since the liberation movement, since a trans woman, you know, through the first act that, that got us to fighting back. Um, but today, having this conversation and looking in the future, we have so much hope that things can be very bright and equal for all of us. Leave us some thoughts on that hope. Oh. Do you share the same hope as I do? I share a lot of hope. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't know that being hopeful is all that popular a thing right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um... I come up against this a lot. I myself tend to be an earnest person. My writing is fairly earnest. Tales is pretty earnest um, and sensitive and, and rooted in compassion. And I think what's much more trendy right now is to be um, sarcastic. And I think it's very difficult to exist in our country right now. We're, ex we're all experiencing so much trauma on a daily basis, and so I feel like we're disconnected from our feelings because it's tough to be connected to our feelings, right? Um, but I feel hopeful because of these conversations. I feel hopeful because when I separate myself from like the internet and I sit down and I look at a person in their eyes and we have these conversations, it's like, oh, wait a minute. I'm surrounded by smart, thoughtful, sensitive people who are, uh, to a one, doing their best. I believe everybody is doing their best. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think if some of us feel that way, probably more people than we realize feel that way. And if we can get underneath the anger, that seems like a path forward to me. Mm. Lauren, thank you so much for being here in San Francisco <laughs> with us. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. Thank you.
This is so nice. Yeah. Oh, so great. So good. <laughs> And thank you all for yes. attending the very first installment of the Commonwealth Club Equality Series brought to you by Salesforce. Don't forget, you can share your thoughts. No, do share your thoughts <laughs> on social using the hashtag equality for all. And you can catch the live stream or the recorded talk, this special talk that we did tonight by visiting salesforce.com slash CWC Equality Series. Or you can go to the Commonwealth Club's webpage. Thank you so much again. It's been a wonderful night. Happy Thank Pride. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yay. Shall we? Shall we do it? You're awesome.